In this video, we begin exploring Greenfoot. Greenfoot is a teaching tool that makes learning programming more fun. Greenfoot uses Java as the underlying programming language. Java is one of the most popular languages in the world and it's been around for decades. Greenfoot even includes its own library of code that extends upon Java, making it easier to create graphics-based games and animations. In fact, everything we create in this course will be some kind of game or animation. Greenfoot is also an example of an IDE. IDE stands for Integrated Development Environment. An IDE is an application that has all the tools needed to write programs. The big three tools are a text editor for writing source code, a translator for turning source code into what's called machine code, and a debugger for helping find problems in source code. Source code is the code we write to create our programs. Again, in Greenfoot, our source code will be written using Java and the Greenfoot library. And that's the focus of this course, learning a programming language and how to write source code to create computer programs. Now I mentioned that an IDE includes a translator. The processor doesn't directly understand Java. It understands machine code, which is the native language of the processor. We could program in machine code, but it's extremely tedious and difficult. Java makes it much easier. However, a program written in Java has to be translated into machine code before it can run. In the case of Java, the translation process involves two major steps, compiling, then eventually interpreting the source code. So when you hear me refer to compiling code, this is what I mean translating Java source code we write into machine code the processor understands. We'll see how to compile source code from within Greenfoot soon. At this point, you should have Greenfoot installed. You should also have the book scenarios folder downloaded and unzipped. Start Greenfoot however you choose. In Windows, I can type Greenfoot in the search bar. The following appears. If you've just installed Greenfoot, it will open to a blank screen prompting you to create or open a scenario. In Greenfoot, the word scenario is synonymous with program or application. A given scenario contains all the files necessary to make that particular program. As previously mentioned, the scenarios we create and use in this course will produce games and animations. We'll start with the Leaves and Wombat scenario, which is a small game from the Book Scenarios folder. In Greenfoot, go to the File menu, click Scenario, then Open. Next, locate the Unzipped Scenarios folder, go to Chapter 1, and select Leaves and Wombats. You don't have to go into the Leaves and Wombats folder. You can just select it, then click the Select Folder button. We see three main areas. The world, which in this scenario is the sandy area covered with the grid. All Greenfoot scenarios have a world and they can all look different. The next area is the class diagram, which gives a visual representation of the structure of the scenario. Last are the execution controls, which are buttons to run and reset a scenario. The class diagram shows us the class structure for the scenario. We see the class's world. Wombat World, Actor, Wombat, and Leaf. Java is an object-oriented programming language, abbreviated OOP. Some people pronounce it OOP, though I prefer to pronounce individual letters in acronyms. OOP languages use classes and objects. A class is a blueprint for creating something. An object is that something created from a class. For example, in real life, a contractor might build a house from a blueprint. The blueprint is analogous to a class, while the physical house he builds is analogous to an object. Now, if we were to look at the underlying source code for the Wombat class, we would see it has all the code necessary for creating a Wombat. We'll look at this source code later. If we create a Wombat from the Wombat class, we've created an object. This is represented in part by a picture of a wombat out in the world. Let's see this in action. 
If we right-click on the Wombat class in the class diagram, a class menu appears. Click New Wombat. Notice the pointer changes to show a picture of a wombat. Move over to the world and left-click to drop the wombat in place. This creates a wombat object out in the world. The thing is, we can create as many wombats as we want using the wombat class. Just like a contractor can use a single blueprint to create many different houses, we can use the wombat class to create many different wombats. Now we have two wombats out in our world. If we right-click an object, an object menu appears. In the case of a wombat, the object menu shows all the things a wombat is capable of doing. Most of the things we see on the wombat object menu are what are known in OOP as methods. Think of them as commands, questions, or requests for information. There are things we can command a wombat to do, questions we can ask about a wombat, or requests for information about a wombat. Many of these method names are such that it's easy to tell what they do. For instance, there's a move method. If we call this method by clicking it, it'll cause the wombat to move one cell in the grid. Notice it causes only this wombat to move because any other wombats are separate objects even though they're members of the same class. It's like if a contractor paints one of those houses blue, it doesn't automatically make all the other houses blue. They have to be painted individually, and they may even be different colors. Same with wombats. We have to command wombat objects individually. Notice the word void in front of the move method name. This is the return type for the method. It indicates what the method does once it has finished its task. Some methods return information, and some don't. When a method name is preceded by void, it means it returns nothing. Void literally means nothing. So calling move moves the wombat one cell and returns no information about the wombat. Notice several methods begin with void, such as eat leaf, set direction, and turn left. Methods that begin with void are commands to the object to do something. Notice other wombat methods begin with boolean and int. A method that returns a boolean is like a question about the object. The answer to that question is either true or false, because a boolean can only be true or false. For instance, clicking can move causes a dialog to appear showing the value currently returned by the method, in this case, true. The reason it's true is because this wombat is in a position where it can move forward. Let's drag the wombat to the edge of the world. Clicking can move this time shows false, indicating it can't move. It can't move because it's directly facing the edge of the world. What happens if we call turn left? Now it's facing an empty cell. If we call can move again, notice the answer has changed back to true since the wombat is once again facing an empty cell. So can move is a question while turn left and move are commands. What about methods with a return type of int? Int is short for integer. An integer in Java is just like it is in math. It's a whole number. So a method that returns an int returns a number that represents something. Get leaves eaten returns an int representing the number of leaves the wombat has eaten so far. So it's a request for information about the wombat. If we call get leaves eaten, a dialog appears showing zero, indicating the wombat has not eaten any leaves. Let's put a leaf in the world. We can do this in the same manner as we did with wombats by right-clicking and selecting New Leaf. To eat a leaf, the wombat has to be in the same cell as the leaf. We could call on the Move method, but the easiest way for this demonstration is to drag the wombat to the square. Now click the wombat. 
Notice this time the object menu is slightly different with choices for the leaf object and the wombat object. This is because there are two objects in the same cell. Let's select wombat, then eat leaf. Notice the leaf disappears from the world. Calling get leaves eaten, the dialog now returns one like we expect. Looking at the wombat object menu again, notice the parentheses to the right of the method names. Method names are always followed by a set of parentheses. Sometimes the parentheses are empty, and sometimes they have something inside, such as is the case with set direction. In this case, direction is what is referred to as a parameter. A parameter is used when the method needs additional information passed to it so it knows how to do its job. In the case of set direction, which is a command to the wombat to change its direction, it needs to know which direction to face, up, down, left, or right. Notice direction has int in front of it. This means the direction is represented as a whole number because that's the way whoever created this method decided it should work. They could have instead created it to accept letters or words, but they decided it would be easiest to use whole numbers. Notice when the dialog appears, this time it's requesting information from us. Look in the comments at the top of the dialog. The direction parameter must be in the range 0 to 3. In other words, we can only enter 0, 1, 2, or 3, representing the direction the wombat should face. Let's try 0. Now it faces right. Let's try 3. Now it faces up. You can try other values on your own. So far, we've interacted with objects by calling methods or by dragging with the mouse. We can also use the execution controls at the bottom of Greenfoot. Let's begin by resetting the world using the Reset button. Reset returns the world to its initial state. Now let's put some leaves out in the world. We can do this the same as before by using the class menu, but there's a more efficient way when we want to create several objects. Left click the leaf class, then hold down the shift key. Now move the pointer to the world and left click anywhere to create a leaf object. Continue holding the shift key and click in various locations to create new leaf objects. The same thing can be done to create wombats. Before we look at other execution controls, let's look at the object menu for a wombat again. You may have already noticed a method we've not discussed yet, the act method. All objects in a world have their own act methods. Calling the act method makes the object do whatever it should do at the moment. It's a void method, so we know that in the case of a wombat, it's a command to make the wombat do something. What does a wombat do? There are three basic behaviors. If it's sitting on a leaf, eat the leaf. Otherwise, if it can move, move forward one cell. If none of the above, then turn left. How do we know this? By looking at the underlying source code. We can do this by right-clicking the class name and clicking Open Editor, or by double-clicking the class name. This is a bit advanced at this point, and I don't want to confuse you. Notice where it says Class Wombat, indicating this is the code for the Wombat class. Further down, we find the Act method and the code inside it. This code is what makes the Wombat perform actions when the Act method is called. The code is what we'll learn to create ourselves as we go through the course. Let's go back to the Object menu for a Wombat and select its act method. This causes this wombat and only this wombat to perform one of the three behaviors programmed into its act method. Again, this is because each object has its own act method that must be called for the object to act. 
let's look at the other execution control buttons. Clicking the Act button causes both Wombats to act. Clicking the Act button calls the Act methods of all objects each time the button is clicked. So using the Act button, we can see the scenario run one step at a time. This can be useful for observing program behavior during program development. Let's put a leaf on the edge of the world and a wombat in an adjacent cell. Before clicking the Act button, think about the behaviors we discussed that are coded into the wombat's Act method. What will happen when we click the Act button? Has it found a leaf? No, because it's not in the same cell as a leaf. Can it move? Yes, because it's not at an edge of the world. Since the answer to that is yes, we know that clicking the ACT button moves the wombat forward one cell. What will happen the next time we click the ACT button? We go through the same questions. Has it found a leaf? Yes, because it's in the same cell. Since that's yes, it will eat the leaf. What will happen the next time we click the ACT button? Has it found a leaf? No, since it just ate the leaf, it's no longer in a cell with a leaf. Can it move? No, because it's facing an edge of the world. The only other option programmed into the Wombat is to turn left. We can continue in this same manner answering the questions, and as soon as one is yes, the Wombat acts accordingly. The Run button calls all act methods repeatedly until we press Pause. And this is how a scenario is normally run, especially once it's completed. Now you may be wondering, if all objects have an act method, why do the leaves not do anything? This is because their act methods don't have any behaviors programmed in. They just sit there waiting to be eaten. As programmers, we can program objects to act however we want, or not at all. Let's look at another Greenfoot scenario. Go to Scenarios, Open, Asteroids 1. Notice the Wombat scenario stays open in another instance of Greenfoot. Click on it, then go to Scenario Close to close the Wombat scenario. Don't choose Quit, as that will quit Greenfoot completely. Looking at the top of the class diagram, we see the classes World and Space. As you'll recall, the Wombat scenario also had a World class, and beneath that was Wombat World. In Greenfoot, there's always a class named World at the top level of the World class's area. The class below it, in this case Space, creates the specific world we see for this scenario. The arrow pointing from Space to World indicates that Space is a subclass, or child, of World. In other words, Space is a type of World. Likewise, World is a superclass, or parent, of Space. Just remember, a class that is below another class is a subclass of the one above. Likewise, a class that is above another class is a superclass of the one below. One of the great things about classes in OOP is inheritance. We can create subclasses that inherit code from superclasses, but add code of their own. The subclasses become more specific. So here, world contains code that is common to all worlds, while the space world inherits that and adds its own specific code. Below this is the actor classes area. Actors are things that live in the world. All Greenfoot scenarios have a world and actors that live there. At the top of this area is the actor class. Just like with the world class, actor has code that's common to all actors. We can then extend it to create more specific actors. Explosion and Mover are subclasses of Actor. Asteroid, Bullet, and Rocket are subclasses of Mover. In this case, the original programmer for this game decided that all objects that move around in the world should be grouped under Mover. Bullet, Rocket, and Asteroid 
because their subclasses of mover are also subclasses of actor. It's similar to how you and I as humans have ancestors up several levels, such as parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents, and we've inherited bits of code in the form of DNA from all of them. In the Other Classes section, we see the Vector class. Don't worry about this class for now. It's used by other classes, and we can't create objects from it. We can play the Asteroids game by placing asteroid and rocket objects in the world using the same techniques we learned previously. This scenario is different from Leaves and Wombats in that we can control the rocket using the keyboard. Soon, we'll learn to write our own code that allows the user to control objects using the keyboard. After clicking the Run button, the asteroids move on their own. The rocket is controlled with the left, right, and up arrow keys and fires when the space bar is pressed. If we pause the game, we can pull up the Object menu on any object. Let's look at the rocket. Notice at the top of the menu, it says the rocket inherits from three different things. Two of these are Actor and Mover. Ignore Object for now. Since Rocket is a subclass of Mover, and therefore Actor, we say it inherits from these classes. Again, what it inherits is code. If we look under Actor or Mover, we see the methods inherited from these classes. On the main part of the menu, we see the methods that are specifically within the Rocket class itself, such as Act, get shots fired, and set gun reload time. Notice that set gun reload time includes a parameter that is used to change the reload time after firing a shot. In other words, it affects how fast the gun can fire. If we call it, a dialog appears. The comments at the top of the dialog explain how to change the rate of fire for the rocket. Try changing the values and see what happens. Remember to click the pause button to access the object menu and change the value, then click the run button to see the results. Since set gun reload time is a void method, it returns nothing. It's just a command. Get shots fired returns an int, so it's a request for information about the rocket, the total number of shots fired so far. Let's look at the object menu for an asteroid. Among the methods there, we see a setSize method that takes a size parameter. If we call that method, we can change the size. Unfortunately, this time the comments don't give us any details about how the size is affected by different values. I know the default size for an asteroid is 64. I had to dig into the source code for the asteroid class to find this information. This is a good example of why it's important to include good comments in your code so it's easier for humans to understand. We just looked at changing the gun reload time by calling set gun reload time. This only changes it for that one rocket object, and when we restart the game, the rocket goes back to the default gun reload time. We can make it more permanent by editing the source code for the rocket class. In the class diagram, right-click the rocket class, then select Open Editor. The source code for any class can be accessed in this manner. The editor is the text editor I spoke of in the beginning, one of the things included in an IDE. If we scroll down, there's a lot of code that won't make sense yet. That's okay, it will before long. Look at this line. The comments to the right of it say, the minimum delay between firing the gun. This is an example of good commenting. So we know this is what we need in order to change the reload time. Now, gun reload time is what is known as a variable, and it's a very important concept in programming. For now, think of it as a box for storing something for later use. This line is responsible for creating this particular box. Once this line executes, the box is created and ready to use. Notice int appears before gun reload time. This indicates the type of data this box can store. Integers. So gun reload time can store whole numbers, nothing else. Next, look at this line. This is a special type of method we'll learn about later. 
It's responsible for creating the rocket and setting certain values. The first value to be set happens to be gun reload time. Remember, we already created the box in the code above. This line here is where something is finally stored in the box. Currently, it's set to 20, which is some amount of time. We'll say 20 milliseconds. The units aren't actually specified anywhere. Let's change the 20 to 5 so there is only a delay of 5 milliseconds between the gun firing. Notice there is a Compile button at the top of the editor. Anytime we make changes to the source code like this, it has to be recompiled. Now with Greenfoot version 3 and above, it automatically compiles the code anytime changes are made. So in my case, I don't need to recompile. Just be aware of that since most IDEs don't recompile your code for you. Once the code is compiled, the program can be run. Notice how much faster the gun fires now, 